Islam General University and he's been author, he has authored more than 25 research papers and he's been a research fellow at Brunel University from 2002 to 2013 <coughs> and has been public health consultant from 2013 to 2016. He did his postdoctoral fellow at Guy St. Thomas Trust in London and now he is a researcher at Oxford University in Biomedical Research Centre. Dr. Sanal Shah. Um, sorry for this short delay. Um, I had a visit uh, to the back maybe last time. Okay. First of all, I congratulate the World Senate Congress for organizing this today's conference on a very important issue. This this topic, uh, the enforced disappearances, is really an important issue, not from the perspective of Pakistan, but from international perspective. And I'm not an expert on enforced disappearances, however, etc. I will give an overview of the roots of the issue, what are the common reasons, and what are, what are the consequences of enforced disappearances, what happens. So, for example, if I give a like, scenario, what an enforced disappearance looks like. It involves like, you know, if you're sleeping in your house in the middle of the night, some people come, armed people come and drag your husband, brother, father out of their bed um, and push him in any army vehicle or un uh, uh, a vehicle without a number of legs. And he's taken out to an unknown destination. And next day you wake up and go to the authorities look at the newspapers, you don't find what happens and everybody denies. Uh, so this is a typical scenario of enforced disappearances. I've taken this from Sola 2006. This book is written about Latin America. But if you read, see the newspapers or any English newspapers of Pakistan or any other country where enforced disappearances happen, do happen, and this is the same situation. So this is a typical scenario what an enforced disappearance looks like. <coughs> so what are the features of enforced disappearances? So they involve either arrest, detention, or abduction of person <coughs> so This is really an important issue because some, sometimes people talk about enforced disappearances and missing persons. I mean, anything could miss without like, being forced to be missing. So we must look into this one, like uh, rather than call, calling them missing persons. It's like uh, if you do an accident, or this, he, this or he or that thing happened because of an accident. So it means there's a onus or a benefit of doubt there. And so it's really enforced against your will. Somebody is like enforcing it. Okay. So this is mostly done by like you know, different levels of government officials and sometimes do it and like you know as my speaker one was saying there are like brigades there. Kishan was saying there are brigades there. So it's like organized groups of private people do this on behalf of authorities. And then the other feature is when you go to the officials or like people in authority and you say okay after like my person is that have disappeared, but they refuse to, it's not a us. we don't know, police says we don't know, army says we don't know, nobody claims that they are holding that person, disappeared person. So this is refusal to disclose is another feature of informed disappearances. And the last is the consequences for the victim, the victim's families. So it's because they have disappeared, so they can't resort to go and to seek the remedy according to the law, national law or international law. 
and they suffer from all sorts of consequences. The families suffer. So what are the rules of enforced disappearances? I mean, it's, I've already defined what the enforced disappearances is. But when we look into the post-World War II era, the enforced disappearances were on rise in South America during the 1960s and 70s, when there were like dictatorships and things there. However, it didn't stop there. And from South America, it shifted to the Asian countries, but I would say especially to South Asia. In South Asia, families, I mean, this, this enforced disappearances are on rise in several, or most of the countries, like including Sri Lanka, Nepal, India, and Pakistan. And there are other Asian countries involved. It's because I'm, I'll focus on Pakistan because we are concerned about this country. And in four disappearances in Pakistan, there was a rise of this issue since 2001 in the wake of war on terror, 9-11 incidents, which give, gave an impetus to the enforced disappearances in Pakistan. And then I'll go to a government organization looking into enforced disappearances. In 2011, Pakistan has established a commission called Commission of Inquiry on Info Disappearance, C O I E D, and they define who is a missing person. A person who has been picked up or taken into custody by any law enforcing intelligence agencies working under civilian military control in a manner which is contrary to the provisions of the law. So, means they're defining that any person who is enforced person is being taken by army or any enforcing law agencies. And any person who has been taken by somebody else is a missing person. So then we must therefore say this is enforced like you know, disappearances, which is in the international law as well. Like there are UN uh, uh, conventions or laws on the enforced disappearances. Okay. So this commission of CIAD has established a database. Because mostly we talk about right now, so many people have disappeared, so many disappeared. So I thought, like, let's have a look at the data, the data, what the data is telling us. Whether this is complete data, incomplete data, biased data, what is telling us? I spent like about like two days to download this data, which is about 350 pages, and putting an Excel and working on this and doing some transformations. So this is the scenario of informed disappearances. If you see, like, about 40% is from KPK, which is Northwest Provincial Province. Uh, these are the cases from this province. And second highest is in about, one, about 27%, followed by Punjab, and then it's Balochistan highest. Don't, don't think that this is the old data there, but this is the data which is available on, on, on the, 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 this commission. And I was surprised why KPK is highest uh, uh, number. It's probably because uh, when we look at this data, I will come back. Uh, I will come back at the same point. This enforced disappearances. I will divide them into two phases. One phase is since 1990 up to 2004 or 2003 or 2003 means until like you know, the war on terror started. So if you look at this data, look from 1990 to 2001, it's majority of in four disappearances are from sin. And this is really clear, very clear there, most of the people coming from sin. And then from 2006 or seven, and then KPK, in four disappearances and KPK are on the rise. The people who are going to the commission or loading their FIRs, <coughs> so I was saying, why there are more? Maybe some people have gone to the war, uh, war on terror or war like jihad in Afghanistan, but they disappeared, and people want to get protection, so they go to the police and say, saying that my person has disappeared, 
So this could be one of the consequences. Other is because in Sawat, this is a Nifal, they would be those are military operations, and then they maybe they picked up lots of people. So there's really a rise there. But you see the Balochistan is from 2005-06, they started rising the number of disappearances in Balochistan as well. But when you look at the grand total, it says only sin is only nine nine hundred. I doubt this is real picture, okay? This is the biased data. This is the data which is available with the authorities. And if you divide them by the population, you see like if you calculate the rate, it will be higher. For example, in Balochistan, look at the Balochistan's population, very little, 233. And you put the rate by 10,000, 100,000, which will be really a lot compared to Punjab. This is again the same analysis. Look at the red line, which is from 2008. It's a, there was a peak of disappearances in Sin from 2014 up to 2017. But the important thing I found, there's a no data for 2017. What does it tell us? I don't know. That, that means there was no disappearances in the whole country 2017. Was it the second year? So this, this is another like missing gate in this data. Because when I was looking into this commission's data, what happens to, what are their findings? What happens to people who have been forced to disappear? And I would only analyze the cases of sin. 54% is still like you now being under, under investigation. There are under investigations since 1990 until 2018. For the last 20 years, we can't find them under investigation. So we are looking into this. And then some people went trace to return home. Okay, trace to return home. And I'm no somebody there. He's 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 here to return home, but he will tell us this story in the very next session. What happens? So, so you see, and the the important word, like you know, dead body recovered, recovered, and there is no information about where, why, how these dead dead bodies were recovered as well. So and there are like you know they claim that this person has been has died in an encounter with either police or uh, law enforcement agencies. So so this this is the set of affairs. Yeah? And so what we say why they do enforce this policies? I'm on a few slides now. So because this is like government practice, like you know, the population to stopping people, like you know, talking against their policies, against their programs, against uh, any issues. And for the victims, it's really a big, big consequence. It's a lot of consequences for them. It's not only um, social or psychological, but economic as well, and political issues for them, and refusal of the rights for. Uh, the the victims countries. For for the victims, as I said, they bring emotional sufferings. The person disappears. They can't find the person. So they can't go get a legal uh, like you know remedy for that. And and this is a last last, last lines. It's a violation of fundamental rights. And it's a really a uh, Terror and its political, religious, and uh, ethnic uh, minorities and opponents of the government. So this is the reason why enforced disappearances do happen. In conclusion, what I would say: enforced disappearances are very wide, like you know, are uh, in most of the countries, and especially in South Asia, in Pakistan. And uh, these enforced disappearances uh, violate people's like human rights fundamental rights, economic rights, social rights. And, and in Pakistan, the data shows KPK is the highest, but we believe this is a biased data. And if it's really true data comes in, so the number will be higher from Sin or Balochistan, especially of uh, nationalist and political uh, leaders. There is a very slow progress regarding the recovery of enforced people, enforced disappeared people. And it's my, uh, what I was thinking, how do we bring our disappeared persons into uh, the documentation?
So S1 is the scenario one, so like one I showed you, it happens to any of the person we know or uh, any family, they should have an NFIR. But I'm sure there will be a lot of resistance to, like, you know, you will be successful in uh, putting in a, uh, an FIR. But at, at least it will be put on the record, okay, this number are missing. And this commission, has, so called commission, has got a online platform, a uh, file uh, aggregation uh, form online. So choose the record so that we are not missed out, like, you know, people are going to disappear, not missed out of the legal remedy. And I would urge the international organization, national organization, active, uh, like, you know, to support the recovery of the victims of equal disabilities. And thank you very much.